Previously on the Challenge All Stars, we were the only team to finish the mission. We were inexplicably confused by the act of untying a knot. We broke a lot of furniture. Then we broke it even more. Hello, other people. Thanks for tuning in to DVR Czar, the channel where TV rules all. And welcome to the Recap Corner. Today, I'll be talking about Season 2, Episode 10 of the Challenge All-Stars, a.k.a. the finale. I thought the first All-Star season was good. I liked watching it. But this season really nailed exactly what I envisioned when the series was first announced. I kind of put off writing my script this past week because I knew that when I rewatched the episode, it would mean that the season was really over. I'd been holding out hope for a reunion, but I don't think we're getting one, which is a real bummer because while I had fun watching this episode, overall, I thought the final itself was just okay. Some parts were great, others totally confused me, but I'm excited to talk about them all. The episode opens at the arena where we left off last time. Janelle and Darrell just sent Jody and Brad home, and as we already learned, the final is about to begin, like right now. TJ directs the cast to several hammocks inside a pavilion on the beach. They're next to a group of logs. For the rest of the night, one person from each team can sleep in a hammock while their partner stands on one of the logs. They can trade places as often as they want. A lot of modern challenge finals include some kind of passive up all night phase. Sometimes there are snakes. Sometimes it's cold outside. This time it rains for a while. It also takes place a day earlier than it usually does which I assume was done to ensure that everyone is ready, and by ready, I mean mentally and physically exhausted, for the real final to start the next day. During the segment, Janelle delivers her best confessional of the season. To stand on a log for 12 hours or so is really nothing to me. I also liked this cartoony moment of MJ immediately falling asleep, full snore, while everyone else lies awake. And Ayana wearing lingerie while she stood on the log. Add it to the list of reasons to recast her. But my favorite part was that Brain Stew played over a montage of the cast sleeping and or log standing, even if that did spur me into pausing the episode to listen to all of Insomniac. In the morning, TJ greets the cast. Are we having fun yet? Yeah. <laughs> Once again, I found myself distracted and, again, had to pause the episode so I could watch a bunch of Party Down. Are we having fun yet? TJ gives everyone a fresh uniform, which is a huge boon. Imagine being John A and having to run a final in denim shorts. You'd be more chafed than Andy Bernard. It's confirmed that everyone will run the final with their partner. I know TJ already said that would be the case back when the pairs first formed, but I guess I'm still traumatized from Jeff Probst giving people immunity, then taking it away because an hourglass broke. TJ introduces this next part as phase one of the final. But really, isn't it phase two? Or was the standing on a log all night in the rain just for the cast's enjoyment? Either way, the day begins with a run from the beach where the cast spent their night to the center of the jungle, which for some reason is called the Nucleus. There, players read instructions for three different checkpoints, which can be completed in whatever order each team wants. In the Decode checkpoint, Players run from the nucleus to a nearby cave and use flashlights to reveal a series of symbols and corresponding numbers painted throughout the cave. Then they run back to the nucleus, input their findings into a decoder wheel, 
and solve a word puzzle using the results. Specifically, they're supposed to spell redemption and perseverance. In the memory checkpoint, teams follow a different trail to a large board full of symbols, each of which has a match somewhere else on the board. They memorize what they can, then run back to the nucleus and attempt to recreate the board by flipping one match at a time. When I was little, one of my favorite toys was a version of this game that used animals instead of symbols. It was innovatively called Animal Memory Game. Finally, in the pole puzzle checkpoint, pairs ride bikes that are tethered together to a clearing full of puzzle pieces. Each team member can carry one piece at a time back to the nucleus. The process is repeated until all 14 pieces are transported. Then they solve the puzzle. Finishing a checkpoint rewards you one piece of a mandala. I don't even know what a mandala is. It's funny you say that. Neither do I. <laughs> Assemble all three pieces to finish the entire phase. Only the first three teams to fully assemble their mandala advance to the next phase, meaning one team will be eliminated. Personally, I've never enjoyed mid-final eliminations and would rather see everyone who made it there get the chance to finish, but there have been eliminations during most of the most recent finals, so at least they're not a surprise anymore. There are a lot of position changes during this phase. Every team approaches it with a different strategy, and each has a completely different narrative as a result. This second, or first, phase was my favorite part of the final. It was exciting, it was suspenseful, at least for a while. The checkpoints were all distinct. I wish there were two more, but I also get why that's unrealistic because the amount of distance everyone traveled just to finish the three is ridiculous. MJ says that the run between the nucleus and the decode checkpoint is one and a half to two miles one way. Though I have absolutely no idea, I'm just going to say that the memory checkpoint is also two miles away. Then Tech tells us that the bike trail in the pole puzzle checkpoint is six miles. There are 14 puzzle pieces with both partners transporting one piece each trip. So that's seven trips, 42 miles on a bike just to finish that checkpoint. And if you manage to complete the other two checkpoints in just a single trip, that's still another eight miles. So at minimum, it's 50 miles per person. Like, what? Am I making too big a deal? Because to me, it seems like an inhumanly high number, unless you regularly compete in those ultra marathons that I watched a really cool reality show about like six years ago. And we learned from MJ that they're competing in 115 degree heat. As for everyone's stories, they range from impressive comebacks to slow declines to snippy slogs, which isn't the name of a Banjo-Kazooie level, but I wish it was. For Ayana and Tech, the story's about being overtaken, either by tiredness, frustration, or their competitors. They're the first pair to the nucleus and choose to start with the pole puzzle bike riding checkpoint. But it ends up taking such a physical toll on Ayana that she struggles to get through the rest of the day. Later, during the decode checkpoint, Tech tries to convince Ayana to write down the answers instead of having to remember them. When Ayana reminds Tech that that would be cheating, he storms off and pouts for a while until finally agreeing to help again. We have the first seven letters. If you'd like to help, we need letters eight through 26. I got 20 to 25. I can't explain it, but something about tech offering to remember letters 20 through 25 when there are 26 letters in total keeps me up at night. Janelle and Darrell also start with bike riding because they view it as less physically demanding than the other checkpoints, which all involve running to another location. Though it's still time consuming and tiring, it works out much better for Janelle and Darrell than it did for Ayana and Tech. 
As they volley for position on the bike path, some tension bubbles between Ayana and Durrell, but it doesn't amount to anything except for another funny Ayana moment, which isn't nothing. At one point, Ayana's walking with her bike in the center of the trail, while Tech walks on the far left, meaning the tether between their bikes is stretched through half the trail. So Janelle and Durrell have to both squeeze by on the right, which messes up their riding, forcing them to brake suddenly, to which Ayana just responds, be careful. I'm going to miss watching her so much. Then later, when both teams are collecting puzzle pieces, Janelle and Darrell ask if Ayana and Tech will let them leave first. They decline, but the next time we see their positioning, Janelle and Darrell are significantly ahead. I wish we'd seen the moment they passed Ayana and Tech. To see the tension but not the resolution is like telling a setup with no punchline. Anyway, Ayana's bike riding is so slow. Post bike ride, Janelle and Darrell's story is mostly about details. Sometimes they get them right in spectacularly impressive fashion. Like when they seemingly complete the entire memory checkpoint in one trip. But other times, they overlook things that cost them. I should clarify that by overlook things, I really mean forget to read basic instructions. It happens during this phase when they follow the wrong path on the way to a checkpoint, and again later when the stakes are much higher. But we'll get there. Melinda and Nehemiah's story is a classic comeback. They start the final in last place after getting lost on the way to the nucleus. Teams are supposed to follow black arrows placed along a trail, but Melinda and Nehemiah accidentally start following blue arrows. Rather than turn around and get back on the right trail, they decide to just keep following the blue arrows, which ultimately lead to a checkpoint they can't do because they never went to the nucleus to get the required equipment. But then none of that matters because their first checkpoint is the memory puzzle, which they choose because they decide the best time to play a memory game is at the beginning of the day when they're at their sharpest, and it pays off. They find all the matches quickly and erase any time lost from getting lost. And they stay ahead even after Melinda hurts her ankle. John A. and MJ's story has the most twists and turns. They start off behind, then make up a ton of time when MJ correctly guesses the answer to the decode checkpoint after he and John A. only figured out half the letters. Then they fall way behind again while working on the memory checkpoint. About a half hour into the episode, it's clear that either Ayana and Tech or John A. and MJ are going to get eliminated. Melinda and Nehemiah finish the phase first. I loved Melinda's reaction. Good job. You just won phase one. Nice work. No. Yeah. Janelle and Darrell finish in second soon after. At this point, Ayana and Tech and John A and MJ share several similarities. Both teams have two of three mandala pieces. Both are also missing the same piece, the one from the memory checkpoint. And they've both been infighting. Well, not really fighting. More like in bickering for what seems like most of the final. What could have been an exciting sequence where two teams race to complete the same checkpoint, or at least are edited to seem like they're in a close race, is instead a race to see who gives up faster. My stream cut to an ad break on the suspenseful, I'm sorry, did I say suspenseful? I meant deflating, question of who would stop threatening to quit and be the first to actually do it. Ayana or John A? Turns out, it's Ayana. TJ's very nice to her about quitting. Maybe because a team had to be eliminated anyway, or maybe because that phase of the final was that hard. Either way, I'm always disappointed when someone quits, especially in a final. And this time was even shittier because Ayana and Tech were still in it. John A and MJ were ahead, but John A was struggling, 
and it's tough to tell because of editing, but I'm going to believe that one really good lap where Ayana and Tech remembered a bunch of matches could have made them competitive with John A and MJ. Because Ayana quits, John A and MJ become the third place finishers by default, and they don't even have to finish their last checkpoint. From a filming and producing perspective, I get it. If you already know which three teams are advancing, waiting for the third to finish their checkpoints is pointless. It's a waste of time, resources, and daylight. But from an audience member watching a competition perspective, it bugged me. They should have to finish the current phase before moving on to the next one. Speaking of... This last phase opens with an eating portion. Everyone must consume a fisheye tostada, a cricket burrito, nachos topped with roaches that look suspiciously like scorpions, and drink a glass of blood, which I guess is an eating challenge staple now. After finishing their meals, teams run to one end of an airstrip, where three different equation sets are printed on signboards. Teams choose one set, each of which has several numbers replaced with symbols. First, teams figure out the numeric value of each symbol, then use the final answer to their overall equation to open a safe halfway down the airstrip. $500,000 cash is inside. I guess money in a safe is also going to be a new staple? First team to put their cash in a bag, then join TJ on a nearby plane, wins the whole final. So here's the thing that bothered me most about the episode. Why didn't Melinda and Nehemiah, who finished first during the last phase, get an advantage in this one? And why didn't Janelle and Darrell, who finished second, get some sort of lesser advantage? It makes the whole previous phase completely irrelevant, unless you're Ayana and Tech, and places the outcome of the entire final solely on this last phase. Anyway, the eating portion offers the usual puking montages, which I'm choosing not to include in this video. Melinda drops a piece of food, then eats it covered in dirt, which is pretty metal. MJ, on the other hand, adopts the Corey Wharton and others method of constantly half-swallowing then throwing up food. I expect at least one person will approach an eating challenge this way whenever the series does one, but it's never become less of a visual onslaught when it happens. It doesn't help that the only footage the editors like more than cast members puking is cast members slow-motion dancing. Janelle and Darrell are the first to start solving their equation, followed by John A and MJ, then Melinda and Nehemiah. It's at this point that I realize how many John A confessionals we've seen in the past few minutes. We saw a flashback of her competing in earlier missions throughout the season and triumphant music plays as she tells us how she solved her equation. Then the music stops as soon as the shot switches to another team. Eventually, all three pairs are simultaneously trying to open their safes. Once again, Janelle and Durrell's failure to notice basic instructions costs them time, as they don't read the full signboard explaining exactly how to turn the safe's dial. John A and MJ make the same mistake, but after they realize it, that triumphant music starts to play again. Their safe clicks open. MJ puts the money in the bag and they start running as the most dramatic, most orchestral, most ridiculous version of All Star by Smash Mouth I have ever heard begins to play. I got it. Congratulations, Congrats. guys. Thank, Thank you. you guys. And suddenly, it's over. John A and MJ win. They board the plane with TJ and it takes off, leaving the other teams stranded on the runway with bellies full of fish eyes and blood. After John A and MJ open their safe, the other two teams both stop trying to open theirs, which I don't really understand. 
And I wish Janelle and Darrell would have kept trying, but hopefully next season will be Darrell's to win. After we hear parting words from everyone, You Gotta Be starts to play, and I immediately forget how sad I am that Darrell lost because, man, that's a good song. It was on the That's So Raven soundtrack, which was a seminal album of my childhood. But then the music switches to a cover of Closing Time that's even sillier than the All-Stars cover, while TJ teases the next season. Closing time, open all the doors and let you out into the world. What do we learn about it? That it's being filmed in Panama and that there's going to be a mansion. What a twist! When Ayana and Tech are eliminated, Tech leaves us with these words. Shout out to my man Neil Maya. If he wins, I wouldn't be surprised. And I'm probably call him and ask him if I could borrow 100000 <laughs> I thought this was such a funny joke, mostly because I don't think Tech realized how much of Nehemiah's potential winnings he was asking to borrow. The total prize is $500,000. Split between two people is $250,000. And once you factor in taxes, which I didn't do, but imagine it's at least $50,000, Tech would be asking for half of Nehemiah's prize. During the phase with the three checkpoints, MJ trying to comfort John A into not quitting felt so menacing to me. Stop just a second, please. In that moment, MJ really reminded me of Hannibal Lecter. Then later, during the eating portion, while drinking the blood, MJ says this. And that's it. All my thoughts about the finale of the second season of the Challenge All-Stars that I could figure out how to convey coherently. My plan for next week is to release a last thoughts video about the season as a whole. Things I wanted to say in other videos but forgot. Things I've changed my mind about since saying and thoughts about each cast member. So come back next Wednesday if that sounds like something you'd enjoy. And even if it doesn't, come back anyway, because you never know what sort of background noise is going to help you sleep. Thanks for watching. Bye. Question. How does one successfully wear a sweatband? Because every time I've worn this one for one of these videos, I end up with this like puffball mushroom of hair in the back from the sweatband just riding up the whole time. And I can't imagine that professional NBA players who wear them are like bobby pinning them to their hair. So what am I doing wrong? The clock is laughing in my face. On my own, here we go. <laughs>